future people it's december 4th 2023 and there are demos for you it's so exciting okay let's start with uh let's start with paul paul show me show us a demo yeah so mine is actually quite simple and easy uh basically i got really fed up when i had lots of chain sets in here so for si users feature toggled on at this moment in time we now have a new trash can icon that sits alongside the chain set name and if you click it it you will actually trash that chain set and it'll take you back to head so it means that we can actually clean up some um, erroneous chain sets uh, which is pretty useful and it's actually one of the requested features that came in at github issues so it's already worked quite well for me all it does in the database is it actually just marks the uh, chain set is abandoned. So there's probably a further turn that we can do where you can unabandon chain sets or do something like that because it doesn't like delete any values or anything like that. So, so yeah, that's it. Fantastic. Um, Let's do Nick. All right. Um, share my screen. All right, so I'm going to show something groundbreaking. You haven't seen it before. Going to grab an asset on the left. Going to place it. It's going to take a second to load. And if it doesn't, because I'm dealing with a slight reactivity issue, I will reload. And we now have components being created with the new graph. You can also Dang switch it. their positions. You can set them separately. Underneath the hood, attribute values exist for the input and output sockets. They're not showing at the moment because there's a uh, there's a bootstrapping issue. But um, this is all using the subgraph now. And what's interesting is is that sockets are now ephemeral. Uh, edges are just edge relationships in the graph, and nodes are an expression of a component's current state. Um, so there's a lot less clutter in the code as well. We we also left the door open for what if there are multiple kinds of diagrams and ways you want to express the thing, um, as well as thought about some future migration patterns. Like what if you want right angles on your lines and stuff for your edges? So uh, looking pretty future forward. You wouldn't believe it, but this was like a 4,000 line diff to do just that. <laughs> so it. It, was, it was kind of frustrating. It was kind of frustrating, but uh, but we made it there. So you can now create components with the new graph, and it's using all the stuff Zach added with the prop tree and schema stuff. So uh, system's coming along nicely with the new graph. That concludes That's my That's fantastic. That's a legitimate milestone. That's big, right? Like... That's huge. That's a lot of work. There's so can many I things have to come together. Yay. This next, oh. Does that mean that... Um this work hasn't stopped the DAO and has now gone into the UI or excuse me, it hasn't stopped at SDF and has gone into the UI and that the actual like um, generic yeah. diagram and uh, diagram node and diagram group actually has to change. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Okay. So it's, no. it's stopped just purely at the SDF level and nothing yes. actually yes. to change. So, right, gotcha. so when I mentioned sock nodes, sockets and edges, they are purely the DAO yeah. concept of them. The front end graph uh, diagram is going to stay exactly the same. It, it, it's it, lookups might be slightly different because it was caching node ID before. Um, but but yeah, it, it its abstraction is identical. The routes the, the routes actually haven't changed. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Yay layers. Okay, um, let's go to let's go to Victor. Okay. Uh, one quick thing. So sorry. Node add menu is also gone too. That that did change in the front end. It's just gone. So oh. and, and that was an optimization we wanted to make anyway. You, That's that UI sense. menus are gone. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. So this one should be pretty quick. Um, just talking about uh backups as they relate to secrets. So uh, workspace backups and module uploads. Uh, so if we go here. Uh, we're going to write a new secret defining component real quick with the help of the snippets that Paul added recently. So secret, if we need a secret definition. There you go. Call her name. Yeah, the form is just going to be a single field called password. That's fine. Just need to add that to here. Uh Be 
Is that it? You go, and now we can contribute it upwards. Call it your demo. I'm going to reject it uh, after this. After this happens. Can go up and just to show you that we can download them too i'm going to go to the module list and find the github demo package that the github secrets demo that is inspired in our uh, blog post i just got all the code from here and just put it online so that in the future i can see like it's going to be really cool because they can point to these modules from from uh, demos and stuff okay if we download it down Come here and see that, yeah, the GitHub token got downloaded. It has the authentication function bound to it. The GitHub repo got downloaded with the qualification on it too. So like the whole package was here. Uh, we had a little bug yeah, last week about not uploading authentications. And yeah, for the last part here, I'm just going to create thing here, connect the edge. And we can in export this as a workspace export. Oh no, something's wrong. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, this is weird. I haven't seen this error before. I need to see if I'm in a wrench or if anything didn't get merged. Yeah, anyway, last week it was working. Uh, demo issues, but <laughs> we believe in you. It's all gonna happen, but it is fabulous. Like that's so close to wrapping that full loop of secret work, so you can actually sort of have the full, so you can have the yeah. full loop of import and export. Oh yeah, and like it's important to mention we're going to like we're just going to wipe secret values for now. We're just gonna not going to like add them to the workspace exports or imports just for security reasons. Like that's the first step, first iteration of this. And then, yeah, the plan is to like add the values themselves, not the values, but like the pointers to the secrets, but not the secrets themselves. So we're going to have like the production. There was a production key value here, but not the key itself on the backup. But yeah, that's it. Yeah, we got a little thought to put in on exactly exactly how we want to deal with it. Because if we do mm -hmm. end up exporting your secrets, then we wind up needing to add like a some layers of encryption to the exports and like it gets yeah. it. Uh, yeah, I, I, like, yeah. The idea is that like, we can get this done without doing the encrypting the backup part, and then we encrypt the backup. Yeah, totally. Probably. Um. All right. Uh. Let's do. Let's do John. Hello, Monday people. Okay, so um, as usual, I have a little slide deck to catch us up of where we're up to. So um, can you see a slide? Hopefully, yes. Okay, so this is basically where we got to. And yes, uh, last week, we pre uh, Scott presented the whole thing working. So um, Firecracker uh, and Cyclone and Veritech are all talking correctly. So when, uh, just as a recap, like when the test button or when an asset attribute was changed, uh, a Firecracker jail was spawned, communication was established to Cyclone, and the task was executed within that jail. So... To make that work, we um, needed two things for Cyclone. We needed a root file system and a kernel image. And that's some of the requirements for these micro VMs through Firecracker. So what we had done to get it to work is we had manually distributed some locally built root file systems and kernel images onto the host and referenced them from the Firecracker config, a bit like this. So we launched the host and pulled them on using like wget or whatever. And then um, it worked. But obviously, if we're running this in production, that's not really good enough because when we have a bug or something in either of these two artifacts, we need some manner to be able to patch them and update them in reference versions, etc. So the first thing we did was created created like a really basic um, CDN through like fronting S3. So we put our static versions of the root file system kernel image into that bucket. And then we could reference them from our Firecracker nodes. 
Uh, so we'd launch Firecracker, say, and there'd be some script or something that would say, pull from this bucket. That was the first kind of step. The second step was then implementing the CI changes. So we needed some manner to automatically do this when we merge into main or even in, as an initial step locally using our build system to distribute them into S3. So <clears throat> from a CI perspective, this is kind of what we ended up with. So this top bit uh, for building the binary we've always had, and we ship those binaries into GitHub, at, uh, GitHub releases at the minute. So we ingest the source code in this buck two target called build binary, or it might be called build, I think, and it outputs the compiled source source code and the dependencies, et cetera. Fletcher and I added two more on the end of it. So we added a thing called build omnibus. I think it's literally build dash omnibus as the bug two target. And that outputs a tar G, tar G Z of this omnibus archive. So let me just explain actually what that is, because I think that's like an internal lingo thing going on there. So um, inside that omnibus archive, you might think of it as like a uh, dependent inclusive archive. So it's got the binary that's meant that's going to run. So Cyclone, and it's also got all its flake dependencies in there. So you could, in theory, ship that onto a different OS and you would have no, no other things but the omnibus archive and it would just run. That's the intention. So to build the root FS for Cyclone, we actually needed to ingest this Omnibus archive and use it to like basically pull an operating system together um, so that we could output the root FS. So what we did is it outputs the targz of a root FS and also a metadata file for the root FS. So each artifact would kind of get both these attributes, if that makes sense. The thing itself and then the metadata of the thing itself. So just from a buck two perspective, we implemented this in a like a tool chain agnostic way so that we're doing this at the minute for Cyclone, but we could implement this across any one of our binaries so that it's kind of like generic and nice. Okay, so let me give you a quick demo. Hopefully it's a quick demo. Okay, so that's the slide deck. On the left-hand side, I've got the SI repo on main and I've just listed the targets for bin Cyclone. So you can see this thing called publish omnibus. That's the task that we've added. And omnibus, the one, uh, the kind of one up from that is that, that one. Okay. So if I publish the omnibus with show simple like boot. I'm just going to do it without that because I can't remember the flag. Okay, so I've pre-built this on my machine. So the actual um, build is unbelievably fast. In our production bucket, you'll see that we've got SI artifacts prod, cyclone, and then we've split it up by architecture. So currently there's two. And you can I don't know if you can see that on the bottom of the screen, but it's yep. currently uploading another one. If my internet will go a bit faster. So it's just uploaded the tar GZ of the artifact from that buck two build. And then it will also push the metadata file from that build as well. So if we look at the metadata file, you'll, you'll see it's like a JSON blob with information about the artifact that it's referencing. Okay. Uh, to make this a little bit easier, um, I added this like viewer into our, um, into our estate, I guess. So you can see and flick through the bucket as if you were in S3, but you don't need to be in our, in our AWS account to do this. So other people can reference it. And this could be useful if you have lots of different artifacts of different versions and you need some way of filtering through. It's noteworthy that um, this particular like UI needs work. I just did it this morning and I'm not a UI god, unlike Theo, et cetera. And that seems pretty good to me, man. Yeah, so you can see here and you can just basically like click and it will download it onto your machine like super easy. So we can reference these from the Firecracker builds directly. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much my demo. Uh, amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's awesome about that demo is that it points the finger at how you're going to, in the end, wind up shipping those artifacts into the world. And because what we do is open source, 
uh, the software is open source. So like a lot of the, a lot of those artifacts, then also we can figure out how do we, like we have to, we can think about how we publish them slightly differently, right? We can, but when we think about building production systems, you can start to think about them as pulling from those same artifact systems. There's all kinds of, all sorts of goodness that lives downstream of that. So super cool. So um, if we want to, I kind of forgot that Omnibus Nix thing was new. I can, I can show what that kind of looks like inside if that's useful. <laughs> Sure, totally. Um, I'll add you to the list, and we'll do you at the end. Yeah. Um. Uh. Okay. Let's do. Uh. Let's do. Let's do Theo. Okay. Howdy, folks. This is very short, very small, but just wanted to show y'all. Uh. Uh. So yeah, just something I added was um something in the UI to show socket arity. Um. So played with some different ways of showing it: shapes, color symbol you know things like that um what i ended up doing was just this little dot um and obviously it's not quite as obvious what it means but you know the alternative like putting an n on every socket that's many feels very busy because most of them are many um so i'm hoping that this dot plus the other behavior will help folks you know build a an intuition of what it means so if i actually go and drag one of these the other edge that's currently connected kind of fades away. So you can, you know, and we can do it, show it in different ways with an X on it or scissors or something. But the idea would be, and this is something that we would probably want to implement in the back end, is that if I do connect something to a socket that has already of one and it's already connected, the other edge gets marked as deleted. Um, and we'll need to do that. We'll need to kind of deal with the inverse as well. If you're like restoring an edge and there's already an edge on it, we'll need to delete the other one, things like that. But yeah, I think even just this little change helps kind of helps build some intuition there. And uh, it also means we're going to have to actually go and mark the sockets correctly with Arity because I'm pretty sure in a bunch of assets there, we just skipped it because it doesn't do anything and you couldn't see it. So Fantastic. I welcome our new dot overlords. Okay, <laughs> let's do Scott. Okay, so I did um, a couple of things um, that are going to be hard to demo. But the first thing we did was the root FS that John was referring to earlier um, is a gigabyte and potentially larger because we haven't actually tested that that's enough space for what we want to do. Um, and every jail that we created would need that copied around. Um, and we're targeting creating 5,000 by default. Uh, and that is a lot of space and a lot of copying, and it's just very wasteful for a read-only file system. Um, so I added what is called like copy on write support um, for for those file systems. So in essence, what this means is that we have a static file that is the root file system. We do a bunch of like device mapper Linux magic to create a layer between that uh, that file that you can like write to if you absolutely need to, and you can reference it as like a static disk. And then we just copy a pointer to that elsewhere um, on the file system. So I'll kind of do some work here to like show you what that means. Um, basically we have um, in these jails like this overlay, um, which is basically a chunk of data that points at a device that also points back to that root file system. So you can see it's called a copy on write store. Um, it's listed as being five gigabytes. Um, ultimately, it ends up getting pointed to a loopback device that like points back to this, which is what Firecracker reads from and thinks is a real device. Um, it's listed as five, but if you actually like get the size of it on disk, it's eight kilobytes. So it's a, a sparse file system, basically. So it's like five gigabytes of, yes, I want this space, but there's nothing in there, but the pointer back to the device. So that's a lot of words um, to say that we don't need to copy these giant files around all the time. We can just create this, really run these really fast commands and then create as many jails as we want and have them reference a single root file system on the disk. Um, so it's pretty cool. It works really well, like better than I thought it would. Um, and I'm uh, really jealous of now I've come to realize I rely on John to make awesome PowerPoints to demonstrate hard concepts. And I need to pick up that habit. Um, so 
the other side of this um, is we kind of refactored how we create the uh, firecracker jails. So we were doing them like on demand, where when you go to start it, we did a bunch of file system work and like uh, networking bits that we changed and like did it in line of actually starting the uh, the VM. So I've moved that to basically just like a static startup process that is idempotent and you can just item potent. You can run it over and over again, and it will only ever create and modify jails if they need to be modified. Um, and then I shoved that process into the startup of air attack. Um, so now like anytime we go to create a pool of cyclones, we run a startup method for um, like whatever runtime type we're choosing. Um, for most of them, they just do nothing. They just return okay. But um, if you're running local firecracker, it'll all of a sudden start doing a bunch of stuff. Um, there's a ton of room for optimization here. Um, it does have to pull this like root FS file system down from S3. And like, I'm not checking to see if it's newer or if we should pull it. It's just kind of blindly doing it, assuming that we should. Um, and it just will start doing a bunch of stuff and then not work and embarrass me in the demo. Um, so that's cool. But I promised that five minutes ago it was working and I'll I'll go join Victor in the back of the room now. But, um, it was well, look, it's been it's fantastic, right? Yeah. It's when it works is pretty sweet. So yeah, it's super sweet. I mean, you know, part of there's sort of two pieces there that are great. So I mean, one is the deployment mechanism where you think about like running fleets of these where like all that setup work just happens on boot. And then if there's an upgrade cycle that can happen too, and it can sort of take care of itself and all of that logic lives with the application as opposed to having to be bifurcated, which is fantastic. And then, you know, when you think about the actual mechanism and system initiative where it's like, Hey, we're going to run a bunch of functions. We're going to do it in parallel. Like even though firecrackers start like shockingly quickly from scratch, like, because we are, we can, we can do better. And so this winds up having all that wiring ready to go. Uh, so they will be even faster. Right. Yeah. And it, it removes like we do a lot of work to get these things started and there's a lot of potential for failure and moving that out of the path of like, I want to run a function was. Yeah. So that was the justification. It's fantastic. Um, all right, Fletcher. OK. There. OK. What I'm going to do is just start this up. So I'm going to build this target called Omnibus. Oh, I already did. OK, good. <laughs> now I can just explain it. Um, so yeah, uh, this is kind of following on with um, what John was talking about, that we need we needed the ability to basically build some of our binaries, our services, um, but in a way where the runtime dependencies ship with, with, uh, with the binaries themselves. So currently right now, all of our building and development, we're doing it in this like Nix environment. So when you build, say, this uh, Cyclone binary, there are potentially, you know, um, runtime dynamic link dependencies. And those <clears throat> happen to be uh, referring to like paths under like the Nix store. So if you just take our binary, put it on an arbitrary, say Linux system, if I built it that way, you probably won't find that that thing runs properly. So um, basically what John and I kind of worked on was uh, what if you could just uh, bring along those Nix packages that you needed to run with the binary that you have. So in our, in our um, Nix flake itself, um, and we've had this for a while and it's going to be so clear because, you know, <laughs> these, these Nix flakes are, uh, um, I find them a little intimidating. Like I'm trying to even find where our package definitions are. Here we go. Um, we do actually have Nix packages for all of our sort of endpoints. Um, this is in effect how our Docker builds have been working inside in the Docker file. We're building a Nix package and then and then kind of doing this trick. So we just formalize the idea. Um, so what does that kind of look like? Um, what I can show here is this is the directory that Buckout puts. It's sort of like the stuff it needed to build in order for us to build the thing. So our tarballs here, that's the that's the whole thing, but I think the package metadata might be the interesting bit. Um, what this is showing looks like I'm gonna need a pager because this one's kind of big. Oh, I'm showing I'm showing actually LangJS's, but that's fine. Um, this one's actually quite big, uh, but same thing. It's a binary. However, the binary itself is actually a shell wrapper script that invokes a invokes Node with some JavaScript code. So 
um, what we've got here, this is kind of metadata this package makes us is uh, sort of all of our, in the package we make, all the programs under bin so we can make a like user local bin symlink. Um, we're pulling along some of the metadata information similar to what we're doing with Docker so we can see the, the commit that built this one, the license, the authors. And this Nix closure is basically all of the Nix store packages that we need to bring in in order to run LangJS. And you can see it's kind of terrifying. Um, yeah, why is Python in there? I don't know. Um, we could find out, but it's needed. <laughs> Um, it's, it's like a rather large, um, runtime set, but, uh, the nice thing is what this tarball has is all of these with some sim links and this metadata. Um, if I was to just show the, the tar here, is that um, a, I, I may be a bit confused, but what, what, what's in the omnibus, is that what can be turned into like a OCI V3 container image or? It's even simpler than that. Um, mm. it, it would help if I actually added a tar argument to that. Um, what you could think of it as, um, this is basically a tarball and you can extract this to the, like to slash to the root of a Linux distro, a Docker container, a firecracker um, instance, or the host that has it. So, um, so if, yeah, if you picture sort of a slash in front of all these paths, um, that's going to lay out nicely on the file system. If I go to the end of this. Oh, it includes the services too. Correct. Oh yeah. It so, um, and then for convenience, because humans are kind of bad at figuring out where's the path to my like LangJS in this example, what we're doing is we're setting up a user local bin symlink called LangJS. So when you extract this tarball, you can run LangJS, assuming you've got a reasonable path entry, that's probably on your path already. And that'll run the program properly. And if this ends up being your mechanic to like install the software and update it, we're also just laying out some, the package metadata. So basically what I was showing is what you get, but in a way that if we install another uh, like version or build of LangJS, you'll get another metadata file. You might have maybe 90% of those packages, those Nix packages haven't changed. So they like a new extraction will just overwrite the other one, but that's fine. Um, and then you'll have two versions, but the sim link will be pointing at the newer one if you extracted that one later. So this isn't like formal, beautiful package management, but it's like just enough to get our work done in like the, the Veritech hosts that might host the Firecracker instances or when we're making the root FSs, or you can kind of use your imagination. I think this is gonna be useful to a point, um, you know, without going kind of to the nines, so. I thought yeah. it's probably worth just everybody knowing that's kind of what we mean by a Nix omnibus package. It's it's using Nix to make packages. It's using, I would suggest a pattern like of an omnibus package, which is sort of a package that contains other packages and multiple binaries. Um, I was a little hesitant because Chef itself has a, a bit of software that's uh, Chef omnibus, which makes this style of packages, but it does it with like a compilation tool chain. So um, that's why it's qualified with Nix on there. Yeah, it's like the fifth version of this that Fletcher and I have written in our life. Yeah. I think, um, I think the what's cool about it is that you, uh, when you think about using these packages and you think about the shape of what it can do, there's lots of different ways that we'll want to ship the software over time. And what this does is let you always basically build it once. And then and then if we want to, you know, if you want to build, you know, root FSs that are going to boot, if you want to build AMIs, if you want to build whatever it is, like, you know what the answer is, which is, extract the omnibus package and then you'll get the exact same bits that you would have gotten if you you know ran it directly on a linux box or you uh, or you put in a docker image or whatever and you can validate that all statically if you want to um, but you can be certain that that's going to work all the way down to the dependencies which when you think about managing like large enterprise deployments of this software is like everything in the universe right because you know that if you look at that like high level revision of the application software you know that all the dependencies are true like, and those dependencies are like all the way down to, you know, the bottom. So super useful. Okay. That's it. Thanks, future people. We'll see you later.